We'll get into Acts 13 again. I'll try to try to finish this up. We'll see. Acts 13. So last week we started looking at this passage and getting some lessons from it about missions, entitled the lesson, A Snapshot of Missions. And truly, um, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot in here that we can, we can take and, and glean from the scriptures about this important subject. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time and ask, Lord, that you'd help me to have wisdom and your strength and power to get across the truths that you've um, laid out here in this passage that we as a church would learn from it and apply these things to our personal lives and to our church corporately, that we would be involved with missions, not just on a missions emphasis Sunday, but that we would take these thoughts and make sure they're part of our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in, in Acts 1.8, of course, we see the Lord giving the great commission that the local church is supposed to go and be witnesses. And then in Acts 13, we see God working through the local church to carry out that mandate that is found there. And we notice a couple things here. Uh, We can go ahead and just start with uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 2. It says, as they ministered to the Lord, and there was a bunch of men there, including there was Barnabas and Saul. Uh, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia and from thence sailed to Cyprus. So we see a couple things. First of all, I'm just in way of review. I won't go stay there long. But we see the selection. God made a sovereign selection. It was the Holy Spirit that called these men to become missionaries. We're all, every Christian is told to evangelize but not every Christian fulfills the office of evangelist, uh, this idea of being a, a, a preacher missionary. I know we, we, we loosely use the term that we're all missionaries. I get that. In the sense that we're all going out and evangelizing and sharing the gospel, in that sense we are. But in the technical sense uh, of holding uh, the office of evangelist, having that position found in um, Ephesians chapter 4, that's a God-called person. Someone doesn't just say, well, I volunteer. I will go start a church in wherever, in, in Panama. Well, that's a nice noble thought, but you just don't do that in the States, and you just don't do that in another country and say, I'm just going to do that because that's a God-called position. It's a sovereign uh, selection. It's a sensible selection. They were both these Barnabas and Saul that God called they were both very um, active already. They were leaders in the church there. Then we see, secondly, the sending. Uh, and God sent them out. We noted in verses 3 and 4 that it says that the, whole, the, the, the local church sent them out. It also says that the Holy Spirit sent them out. And so which one was it? Yes. Uh, I think you can look at it this way, that the Holy Spirit is the sending agent in the, holy, in, in the local church, it would be the sending agency. They work together, right? God calls, and the local church confirms that call and sends them out. It's just how God has ordained it. And then we see there was a commitment also made as they sent them. They, they, they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them there in verse 3. We see the sacrifice and prayer. And that's something that shouldn't just be a one-time thing. Well, I prayed for them. As we sent them away, no, we should continue to pray for them. As we noted, uh, the Armacos are leaving for the mission field tomorrow. And they're still <laughs> on deputation today, uh, uh, out uh, preaching and presenting the, the, the work there. And so they're going to get back sometime tonight, get up sometime tomorrow, hopefully, <laughs> and head to the airport. So we need to pray for them. We need to be in prayer now. We need to be in prayer when they get there. We need to continue to pray as they're ministering. So we just see the sending as a confirmation, as a commitment. There's also a cooperation. It's interesting that God called and sent two men from the uh, congregation. It was a team effort. And we often see that in the scriptures. 
the missions, uh, there, there were coal laborers. Then we noted the third idea was the service. What did they do? They went there and they preached the gospel. We saw that in verse number five. We also saw them persevering in, in verse number six. They went through the isle of uh, Cyprus. They went from Salamis to Paphos. And it was about 90 miles as the bird flies, so to speak. And so they, they, they went at it. And who knows all the different challenges they found along the way. But they kept at it. I want to pick up our lesson now. And we'll see fourth point, fourth idea. And that's uh, the struggle. We see a struggle. I mean, things are going great, right? They, uh, they went, they're preaching, they're persevering, they're going and they're going, and um, there's a struggle. Now, it ends victoriously, praise the Lord for that. And a lot of times we want the blessings, but we don't want to put in the hard work to get those blessings. You know, we just, we're in January still, right? And I think some, some people, and it's by the end of January, so... It, all those notions of losing weight that you put on <laughs> have gone, right? Yeah, I put some weight on over the holidays. Oh, those are a long time ago. Well, I guess this is my new normal. Uh, it doesn't have to be, right? Uh, persevere. Well, there is a struggle. If you want, um, if you want some victory, you got to have a fight, right? And so you you got to work at it. And when you work at it, then you see. Some good results. So they worked at it. So a couple things about this. We'll look at a few points as we go along and see in their struggle. First thing we see, it wasn't really a struggle, the first part, was openness. Uh, praise the Lord in verses 6 and 7 that they found a man who, as the scripture says, desired to hear the word of God. Let's read there in uh, Acts 13, verse number 6 and 7. And when they had gone through the isle of Antipapos, they found a certain uh, sorcerer a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, he's not the good guy. We'll continue here. Verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So all of, all of a sudden, we, we're starting to see a little uh, potential problem. There's a sorcerer there who is a false prophet. But there was also... Uh, a guy there who wanted to hear the word of God. You, we know right away the sorcerer, the false prophet, did not want to hear the truth because he's busy propagating something that's not true. But there was someone there that did want to hear, and there was an openness there. And what a thrill it is for missionaries to find people who are open and receptive to the word of God. And this is what we need to be doing. We need to be praying for our missionaries, that God would give them opportunities to present the truth and find people who, obviously God sent them there to reach somebody. We gotta be praying that God would open up those hearts and arrange those situations and, and help them to meet those people that God uh, has put them there for. He has people waiting to hear his word. Otherwise... Why would he send the missionary, right? But uh, what if the missionary never goes and never gives them that word? What if God calls some people, more people from our church to go and we don't go? Then there'll be people like Sergius Paulus who want to hear, who desire to hear the word of God, need to hear the word of God, and they'll never hear. And there could be Many, many people whose eternity can be affected uh, in a good way or a bad way, whether we go or don't go and give the gospel. So we see the openness, but secondly, now we see uh, the struggle here. We see opposition. We read about that already starting there in verse number six, this uh, false prophet. Uh, and now in verse eight, it says, but Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, same guy is found in verse 6. Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So you've got this guy who wants to hear. You've got missionaries who are there to give them the gospel. And then you've got someone there who is going to try to stop them from giving the gospel. Who will withstand. So I don't know about you, but when I want to do something, I want to be a 
allowed to do it. I don't want any pushback. And here's the pushback. The devil's got someone there to resist and to withstand and to go against them. And you can mark it down that the devil's not happy when you enter into his territory. Okay? You think the, 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 the Satan's jumping up and down and saying, wow, this is great. The armacosts are going to Myanmar to spread the gospel, to learn the language and to serve the Lord. Isn't that a blessing? Uh, no, he's not happy. He's not happy. I was just talking about this in my missions class on Friday. You go into the devil's territory, he is not happy, and you're invading an area that there's a stronghold. As bad as America has gotten, and as much as we have turned away from God, and we truly have, if you go visit many other countries, you'll see that there's still a huge um, Christian influence in this country. There really is. And those people who have spent, you know, I had teaching that and missionary kids are in, 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 the, uh, in my class nodding their head, yep, yep, because there's a lot of things in our culture that are still Christian based. I'm not saying everyone's a Christian, uh, but just common courtesy. You know, you come up to a stop sign and someone waves you on. Where does that come from? That comes from the Bible. You esteem other better than yourself. That is a Christian principle that even unsaved people still practice that because that's a Christian influence that's in our culture. Um, you go to some places, you pull up the stop sign, there's nobody going to wave you on. You do to them before they do to you. You, you have to pull out. You've got to cut them off. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to be a jerk. Because they're going to be one to you. And you say, well, where does that come from? It comes from a society that hasn't had God in it. Anyway, I'm really getting off my point here. But you're going into a society. I'm trying to, I was relaying that to you so you understand that in a very small way, there is a stronghold. There is a, a, an opposition. There is a pushback. There is uh, a darkness in many uh, parts of the world and I know there's demonism here, and I know there's wickedness here, but there is, there is uh, the next level in, um, in, in other places. Just mark it down. You don't believe me? Go live there for a while. Uh, I've been on both sides. <laughs> so um, the sorcerer, the false prophet, withstood them. And missionaries are going to face spiritual warfare. I get it. We face it here, too. But the devil's going to go against them, and these attacks can come in a number of different ways. Um, I've experienced some. I've, other missionaries we've sent out have experienced some. You, there, there can be threats. There can be false accusations. There can be physical attacks. There can be health problems, uh, financial strains, whatever. And how we need to pray for our missionaries and not to forget our missionaries. A little uh, saying, out of sight, out of mind. Oh yeah, yay, it was all exciting. It's, you know, having a special service with the Armacost last Sunday night, now they're gone. Well, okay, well, bye. See you in a few years when you come back on furlough. Yeah, I might pause and read the prayer letter. I might pray on about something that's mentioned in the prayer order. Is that our attitude? Hope not. All right, so there's an openness, amen? There is an opposition, but then thirdly we see in verses 9 through 12, there's overcoming. Look here, in verse number 9 it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, praise the Lord, you need Holy Spirit-filled missionaries, set his eyes on him, and said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. Now, let me pause for a minute. Um, do you think that at this point, Saul needed to be right with God and filled with the Spirit of God and energized by God to withstand this type of opposition? Do you think so? Obviously, yes. And that's why it's important for the church to have interaction with a guy who says he's called and to... See if there's some kind of evidence that he is called because it'd be irresponsible for them just to send somebody who's 
really, they're not sure if how, how good of a Christian he is and how much he's walking with God because they're sending him into harm's way. And if he doesn't have a track record of walking with God and being filled with the Spirit of God now, then what are they going to do then? It's going to be a problem. Anyway, so verse 10, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Don't you like this? Here's a preacher. And he's not afraid. He's going to tell it like it is. Can we still do that in 2024? Or do we have to soft shoe everything we do and, oh, um, you know, maybe you should consider that this might be a bad thing? Or can we just preach, thus saith the Lord? Are we allowed to do that still? Is this what God wants us to still do? Seems pretty conclusive to me. The guy's filled with the Holy Spirit. And we can see how a guy who's filled with the Holy Spirit actually deals with opposition sometimes. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Let me continue. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. But then it says, and then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So in verse 9, we see some fortitude, right? Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, and God gave him power to do battle with the forces of darkness. And we can remember that God, this is an application for us all, that the Lord will strengthen all of us to fight his battles. Whatever that battle is, sometimes it's a battle with our flesh. Sometimes it's a, a battle for souls. There might be an attack on your home. Whatever it is, the Lord will give you strength, and you can be thankful for that. But secondly, we see that there was a fight that was there in verse 11, 10 and 11, uh, and Paul rebuked the sorcerer. He did it sharply. Uh, I don't think he was mean and nasty. I think he just said it the way it was. And God smote the man with blindness, um, and this should be also encouraging to us, whether you're working in the bus ministry, going out on harvesters, uh, whatever you're doing, working in the nursing homes, or whether you go to a mission you field and you say, well, I don't want to face uh, opposition, you're going to face opposition anywhere you go. But it is, what it should be encouraging to us is that the Lord is stronger than any foe that we will encounter. We don't have to be afraid. We can go and boldly serve the Lord. We can give out that gospel tract. We can speak a word for God. God will help us in the fight. So there's fortitude, there's a fight, and then we see, thirdly, that there is faith. We find this there in verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. It says, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Because God's man didn't back down when he was opposed, he didn't quit, he didn't pack up and say, I'm going home. He stayed faithful. Because of that, there was a great spiritual victory. And the deputy believed. You know what? God's methods work. Missions is still effective. Now, do you think that the serious kind of prayer offered up by the church back home had anything to do with this kind of victory here? I think so. And what if the church doesn't pray diligently for its missionaries and they encounter problems and opposition? Will there be the same victory? Is the success of the missionary partly affected by our prayers? If it is, woe unto us if we're not praying like we should. All right, so there's a, there's a struggle. And, but as we see, that struggle paid off, right? In the end, there was a great victory through the struggle. So it's always worth the fight, right? 
go back to the illustration. When you step on the scale after that excruciating process of self-denial, right? <laughs> and you say, oh, wow. I lost some weight. I'm back to my pre-holiday weight. Woohoo, yeah. Then you're like, yeah, that was worth it. Right? All right, let's get back, get back to our, our, our notes here. So fourthly was the struggle. Oh, and there was a victory at the end of the struggle, but now we see something else. Verse 13, we see a setback. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, so they're done on Cyprus, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So remember that they had John Mark at the end of verse 5, John Mark to their minister. He was helping them. Uh, and now we see here in verse 13 that the missionary team lost one of their helpers. Now, John Mark was a nephew of Barnabas. Um, he went along assisting them. He probably wouldn't have gone along in the first place if he didn't have a desire to serve the Lord. And we also know later that he did serve God because he wrote the Gospel of Mark. So he wasn't like a loser, okay? But he did leave. And according to Acts 15, 38, Paul indicated that his departure was not a good thing. We don't know. We're not told why he left, under what circumstances. We just know he left, but not on the best of terms. Um, interesting. Was he called? He wasn't mentioned there in Acts 13 as one that the Holy Spirit called, said, separate me unto the work whereunto I have called them. We don't know if he was called or not. Doesn't say he was. Doesn't say he wasn't. Uh, we do know he left. But why? I don't know. Perhaps the journey was more difficult than he realized. Maybe after 90 miles walking across uh, Cyprus, he's like, you know what? I came to help, not, not to get a, like a permanent workout. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he, he, uh, he saw the spiritual op opposition going on, and he's like, whoa, there's a sorcerer. There's a false prophet, and he's going against us. I don't like that. Maybe. I don't know. But one thing we do know is that there was one less person doing missionary work, and it's uh, important uh, to, I think the point in, in this is it's important to know if you're called. If you're called, um, it'll help you carry through a lot. And it's also vital for us to remember us back home to pray and intercede for our missionaries so that we don't have uh, missionary casualties, okay? Because they do face a lot. So we don't want to be too hard on Mark, because praise the Lord, he, he did uh, end up continuing to serve the Lord. Number six in my outline, we see the steadfastness in verse number 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So thankfully, the two missionaries who were still there, they pressed on. They just said, okay, let's keep going. Despite the difficult conditions, the spiritual warfare, the, pers the personnel setbacks, uh, missionaries need to just determine to remain faithful if they want to see more fruit. And this is what we see in, this, in the spirit of these men. Again, I think before we send people out as missionaries, it is good to make sure that they've been tried and proven a little bit, that they're not quitters. Um, and we got to remember also that the devil uh, was not the only one at work. God was working too. Amen? And he worked through the missionaries, and he strengthened them, and they continued. And they kept their focus on the right person, and I think that's how they persevered. Things are going to get tough in life, aren't they? We're going to have some opposition. There's going to be some pushback. But we can't quit. We can't give up. We've got to keep on going forward, even when you don't feel like it. Are there ever times you just don't feel like reading the Bible? Just be honest. Don't look at me like, oh, no, I always just jump up ready to read the Bible. No, you don't. 
And if you do, praise the Lord. <laughs> but we don't always. Do you always feel like going to church? No. Some days it'll be like, man, I could just, you know, it's cloudy out right now. I could stay in bed. I could snooze. I could skip Sunday school. I mean, it's just Brother Olson. <laughs> I'll get there for the real thing. I'll get there for the main service. That's why they call it the main service, right? The stuff before is, must be the minor service. I don't know. <laughs> but when things get difficult, we need to keep looking to God like the missionaries did for help. And that is faith. And faith pleases God. You know, I think a lot of times we just do things and we do it without faith. I mean, God's been knocking on my door a little bit about, where's your faith, buddy? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no. Where is your faith? I need faith. We all need faith because that's what pleases God. Don't you want to please God? Then, uh, lastly, aren't you happy when we get to the last point? Don't worry, it's a long one. Uh, you thought you were going to get out early. <laughs> um, we see the success. I didn't know how to, what to name this point. It's kind of like the success, the summary. As I was kind of saying, um, this chapter provides us a snapshot. There's a whole lot, and I, I want to hopefully tie this together. So along the way, because uh, I'm not going to preach through the, or teach through the entire book of Acts and give you a whole dissertation of everything that happened in missions, but there's so much just from this chapter and even spilling into the next one a little bit that just gives us a pattern that we can see continues. Um, along, the, along the way, again, the missionaries saw souls saved and churches started. It's interesting, it never says that, oh, they went to the city and they started a church. It doesn't really say that. What they did is they went to a city and they preached the gospel and uh, Obviously, people got baptized and they were discipled and that's kind of how the churches got started. Just It's kind of like a matter of fact, oh, and the churches or whatever. It's like, well, where did those come from? They came from fulfilling the Great Commission. So a pattern of hard work, spiritual battles, and victories follows throughout the rest of the book of Acts. It just kind of keeps going. There's hard work, there's battles, there's going, there's persevering, there is opposition, and then there's victories. That's the Christian life. That's the work of missions. You know, sometimes we read missionary biograph biographies or something and, and uh, you hear all these great things, or you must, might read a prayer letter from a missionary, you hear all the great things. Yeah, but in between those great things, there's a lot of routine, just doing what you're supposed to do every day. And sometimes there's struggles. They don't, you know, the pra missionaries don't write in their prayer letter, today I felt like quitting, you know? <laughs> and boy, it was really difficult today. And man, the people hated me, you know? <laughs> I remember sometimes I'd, I'd get up and preach. One guy would get up and tell me afterwards, I'm leaving the church. Next guy, another guy would say, that was the best thing I've heard. I haven't heard, you know, we need this type of preaching. I was like, oh, what, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is just what goes on. Anyway, and you're not going to hear about that. It's, it's just the routine. It's just staying faithful and it's doing what God wants you to do. Um, I, um, since I had, you know, between last week and this week, I, went back and put some extra things in my outline so the lesson kind of grew a little bit. Uh, I don't have time to really go through it in great detail, but let me just give you a, a quick snapshot. You can just jot these things down. I won't read all these verses. I want to just give you the, the, the quick things. If you, if you like to take notes and if you like alliteration, I'll give you a bunch of C's here, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, in, as we go through the rest of uh, Acts 13, in verses 42 through 44, first of all, we see conviction. All right? They went, and there was an earnest desire by some to hear more of God's word. There was conviction. Then we see, again, conflict. More conflict. You say, well, wasn't there some already? Yeah, now there's, they went to another place. So there's new opportunities for conflict. Amen? Uh, <laughs> more people can 
can dislike you and go against you. But that's all right because there's going to be more people who get saved and more people who like you too. And in verse 48, 45, they see the conflict. So when God works, so does the devil. And envy caused the Jews here to oppose the missionaries. If you're there, look in verse 46. We see courage. The missionaries um, would not be deterred. They, they met the opposition with boldness again. And we know that boldness comes by the Holy Spirit. We find that in Acts 4, 29 and 31. And then we see consolation in verses 47 and 48 of thir chapter 13. Um, though the unbelieving Jews were upset, they, they weren't real happy. The Gentiles were glad. There was consolation. They were like, hey, at least there's somebody happy, right? In a, and on any given day, uh, it seems like the pastor is the most hated guy in the church and, and also the most loved guy in the church. That's just kind of how it goes sometimes. The guy who doesn't like him is the carnal guy who he put his finger the, on, on their sin and they didn't like it and they squirm. He's like, wow, who does he think he is? And the other person who's got a soft heart and willing to follow the Lord says, oh, I needed that. Thank you, Lord. And so that's just how it goes. Um, and by the way, when you're... Uh, having a bad day on your bus route and say, that kid hates me, that family hates me. There's another one who likes you. Most of the time, right? <laughs> so there's consolation. Um, then there's conversion there in verse uh, 48. Isn't that a blessing? Um, many believed. It was worth the effort, isn't it? Uh, the end of the verse says, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Then we see in verse 49, there was circulation uh, because, I'll just read that verse, then the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. What happened? People got saved and God's word just started spreading. The people who got saved took the gospel to other parts too and told their friends and their neighbors and their relatives and all that. And the gospel quickly spread throughout the entire region. Uh, wow. Again. It was worth it. And then we see condemnation. Ooh, yo. Oh. See this pattern? Victory, problems. Victory, problems. Hey, get used to it. It's the Christian life. We're not at the crystal cathedral with the crystal uh, you know, pulpit saying something good is going to happen to you today. Because you know what? Something bad might happen to you. If God allows it and if he has a purpose to work all things together for good through it, so we shouldn't have to fear all of that. And that's why some people, oh, I don't want to go to the mission field. Something bad's there. Yes, but there's something good waiting too. All right, so um, condemnation in verse 50, the Jews again became more upset. They persecuted the missionaries and the, the preachers were kicked out of the region. Get out of here. All right, well, in verse 51, we see confidence. The missionaries, they weren't thwarted. They went to another city to preach the gospel. Why? Well, they believed that God was going to work. He had already worked. Why won't he continue to work? And he did. And also in verse 52, we see comfort. Uh, how, did the missionary, how did those missionaries press on after all that opposition? Same way we will. God filled them with joy and the Holy Ghost. Look at there in verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So following God, serving him, brings great joy. It brings a filling of the Holy Spirit um, and added power to be able to continue to serve him. So, again, in verse 48, the people believed. In verse 49, uh, um, yeah, in verse 49, people believe, and the gospel was spread throughout the region there in verse 49. In verse 50, there's more problems, more opposition, more troubles. They pressed on. They were filled with joy. In verse four, uh, chapter one, 14, verse 1, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, did what? Believed. So was it bad they got kicked out? No. Because they went somewhere else. God had some more people waiting. And not just a few. A great multitude. God can take our disappointments and our battles and our trials and turn them around for his glory. Amen? And so, 
a great thing happens in verse 1. Well, what's our pattern? What's going to happen next? More problems. Well, fine, I'll just quit the Christian life. Oh, that's brilliant. No. Verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Verse 5. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, and they were aware of it and fled. So there's more problems. But they pressed on in verses 5 through 7, and then they saw the power of God at work in verses 8 through 10. A, a man was healed, and soon, however, they had bigger problems. So there was opposition, they pressed on, God blessed, and then they have bigger problems. They talked about stoning him back in verse number 5, and now we see in verse 14, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Those are the places that kicked him out before and didn't like him. They followed him, said, we're not happy just that he's gone. Let's track him down. Who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. They, they did such a good job at stoning him, they thought they had killed him and just left him there. So that doesn't seem fair. No, it doesn't. What's really interesting um, in verse 21, and when they had taught the gospel, see, they left, but when they taught the gospel of that city and then taught uh, many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. I mean, was Paul crazy? They stoned him. He, they, he, they kicked him out in those other places. And he went back there anyway. Say, he was quite courageous. Yeah, but we see this pattern, don't we? We see opposition, we see God giving strength, we see victory, and back to more problems. <laughs> so despite their problems, by the time their first missionary journey had ended, uh, many people were saved and churches were started. Now again, there's no verse there that says they started a church. But look there in verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders, those are preachers, pastors, rulers, overseers, same, same guy, in every church and had prayed with fasting. Now they're praying with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So where did these churches come from? Well, they had started them. It doesn't say they started them, but they had started them because people got saved got baptized, people were disciples, people were growing in the Lord, and they had come together, a church is an ecclesia, it's a, it's a, a group of called out believers that assemble together, and they're united, and we see the Lord giving them spiritual leaders here, and then verses uh, four, 25 through 28, the missionaries returned to their sending church, and they reported what God had done, and they remained there for a while, and we call that furlough. Uh, before going out uh, on another missionary journey, which happened in Acts 15. This is the pattern that we see here. I continued it a little bit there in, verse, in, cha in chapter 14 so we get the whole overview. But really, ch chapter 13 gives us the snapshot. There was preaching, there was persecution, there was perseverance, and there was power. That's how God works. The God, the devil's going to work against God, but God works. And if we're faithful in whatever ministry you're in, God will give you victory. We see that pattern throughout the book of Acts. That's the snapshot of missions. And interestingly enough, we see the same pattern continuing in modern day missions. You say, well, why did you teach all this? Well, because I want anyone who's called to realize, hey, I need to go and do what God wants me to do. And I want, I think we as a church need to remember that when people are called, we're sending them. And they're going to have this type of experience. And we have to intercede for them. They're working on our behalf. And we need to 
as we mentioned Sunday night, hold the rope. They're going into that deep mind. They don't want to be forgotten. They don't want you to let go of the rope. Ah, and they feel like they're falling. They're going to experience spiritual opposition. But through God's power, and some of that comes, yes, from the missionary being right with God, but it also comes from a church praying for their missionaries. But through God's power, we'll see some good things happen. No one should be afraid to go out and serve the Lord because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't be afraid of going to the mission field. Uh, yeah, you, some of you, you know, we, we, we had some struggles when we were in the mission field. And I didn't exactly like all the problems that happened. But I sure like telling the stories about how God intervened and did some great things. But <coughs> I wouldn't have any good stories if I didn't have any problems. But the, the good stories are able to brag on the Lord and what he has done because he is great. So we need some men who are called, willing to be called, courageous and committed to take the gospel to those who have never heard. And then we need a church that's passionate about sending their missionaries and sustaining them when they get to the field. This is God's plan. This is a snapshot of missions. And this is what we're called to do. So let us pray that God will call people to the foreign field. And may we be busy for the Lord and found faithful enough to be called. And when people are, that we rally behind them and do what we should do. And never forget, people are going to face opposition. And we need to hold the rope. And then, let me just throw this out too because I've been on the other side of this too. When our missionaries return home, we should be eager, as Acts 14, 27 says, to hear all that God had done with them. They are want to proclaim everything that God has done, but we sh should want to hear and be interested. And when we're not excited to hear what, what's going on in their mission field, which is really an extension of our church, a missionary can only conclude one thing. That we didn't spend much time praying for them. You know what hurts a missionary? When you come home, they say, well, how was it over there? And then you say a sentence or two, and then they're on to the next thing. No further interest, no further questions, no further anything. It just makes you say, hmm, wonder if you were holding the rope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your faithfulness. Help us not to be so caught up with ourselves that we forget our fellow laborers whom we've sent out. May we ever be faithful to pray. And may we also, like the missionaries we read about, realize that we're going to face opposition, but through your power, we can persevere and see victories. Lord, help us not to fear and to remember that you are stronger than any foe that we will ever face. May you bless the truths that we found in this uh, portion of Scripture today and give us a blessing from the message to follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.